Hello, wonderful podcast listeners, and a special big shout out. Hello, and thank you to my marvelous, marvelous, generous patrons. I am so glad you're joining me, trying something new today. Some of you, and certainly my husband, telling me I should try videos as well as the audio podcast. So I decided I'm going to give that a try. And what better time than after my wonderful trip to London. And I went a bit abroad this time from London up to Norwich and um, to Hever Castle and Hampton Court. And so today I will be sharing with you how I walked, where Anne Boleyn walked. I felt like I was walking with Anne Boleyn. So wanted to share that with you today and to thank you for listening let me know how you enjoy having this a video for those of you who are watching on video. If it's still working for you, I'll describe what we're looking at a little bit if you're watching only on or listening rather on audio. But think about, you know, going over to YouTube and give this a try because it is something I'd like to try out and get your feedback on. So please let me know how you like it. So I'll be going in and out of PowerPoint. I do want to share some of these images because they were so exciting. And then I want to talk about them. So I'll be coming in and out. So let me share my screen and we can take a look. We are starting with walking with Anne Boleyn from Hever Castle to Hampton Court Palace. I was lucky enough to get to go to both of those places and meet some very special and speak with some really wonderful people. So it was it was terrific opportunity. Now, I want to start with Anne Boleyn and ask, what is it about Anne Boleyn? Some of you know, I love this image. This is from a Washington Post article in 2013. Um, when Prince George was born, when the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge had their first child and it turned out to be a boy, Prince George. Now, there are several queen consorts in English history and several wives of Henry VIII, in fact, who did not have a son as the first child. But who is it that's the target of the dig here? Take that, Anne Boleyn. So what is it about Anne Boleyn? Why is she so controversial? Why is she somebody that people just focus on? And there's quite a bit of criticism and negativity and also a lot of fascination. So she's sort of the most beloved and the most hated of Henry VIII's wives. And why is that? And I think that Anne captures our imagination in ways that very few, very few characters in history are able to, and really captures our imagination and then refuses to let go. Now, I will share with you that this image of Anne, this portrait of Anne is my very favorite. It is on exhibition at Hever Castle. And I realize that according to contemporary descriptions, she was, as a friend put it, quote, good looking enough. So this may be quite a complimentary, quite a prettified, I heard someone call it, portrait of Anne, but I like it so much because it shows, I think, Anne at the beginning, um, maybe when she's just returning to England. And that's, of course, what happened 500 years ago this year in 1522, after her time in the court of Margaret of Austria and after her time in the French court, she comes back to England with a splash in the English court but she's just starting out and she's younger and maybe softer at that time. And so I really love this portrait of her. And I believe it shows how she's captured our imagination, that famous bee necklace. It's just a great, great image of her. And so she captures our imagination. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of the story of the Boleyns at Hever Castle and how they came to own this castle. Of course, we sometimes get the idea that Anne Boleyn sort of joins us out of nowhere. I'm going to just um, come back at you for a second and I'll put you right back at Hever. Don't worry. Um, we have this idea that she comes out of nowhere, that she's a commoner and that she has a very low level family and sort of breaks into the scene. And then through her wheeling and dealing and manipulating, the king brings her family into favor. Well, actually, that is not the case. The Boleyns particularly her father and her grandfather and then her great grandfather, Jeffrey. So we see this series of Boleyns making very advantageous marriages, Jeffrey and William, and then Thomas make very advantageous marriages and William Boleyn and Thomas Boleyn, Anne's father and grandfather, really benefit from the Tudors coming to the throne. 
when Henry VII comes to the throne, he does not have a large family of nobility to fill all the positions. So he relies instead on educated, qualified people, people who had been through the ends of court, people who had attended the university. Of course, when I say people, I really mean men. But he wanted these men who had been trained in law or in government, in philosophy, to be his counselors. And so William and then Thomas Boleyn really benefited from that. And Henry VIII kept that path going. Now, Henry VIII had a little better relationship with the nobility than his father did. But still, if you look at his great counselors, first we have Thomas Wolsey and then we have Thomas Cromwell. So he really was favoring not just the nobility, but also men like Wolsey, like Cromwell, and like Thomas Boleyn, men who were smart and men who were dedicated and men who were hard workers. So we'll go back to Hever, which the Boleyns are um, sort of, let's, let's say they move in um, during Thomas's lifetime. And although Anne and Mary and probably George were born at Blickling Hall, they grow up at Hever. That is the family home. And there are other properties that they own, but they seem to really prefer Hever. They spend a lot of time at Hever. Seems to be a bit of a haven for them. And looking at it, boy, I can see why it's just so beautiful. So here are a couple of pictures of me. I absolutely hate pictures of me. So we're going to share these very quickly. But I did go to Hever. I was quite proud of myself because I walked from the train station through the field among the cows. It was fantastic. And then I got to meet there on the right. Just look at Kate McCaffrey, not at me. Um, I got to meet Kate McCaffrey and talk to her a little bit about Hever and the exhibition and Anne. And that was wonderful. I so appreciate her taking the time to spend some time with me. She and Dr. Owen Emerson have put together this marvelous exhibition, Becoming Anne. And as you can see, it started in March and it's ending now in early November, but it was extraordinary. And it tells the story of Anne and her family at Hever and sort of emphasizes why and how Hever Castle is so important to the Boleyns and to Anne in particular. So we do have this lovely image here of Anne as a little girl growing up at Hever. And I really like this. You know, you sort of feel like as you're walking through the castle and then you see these images and you can imagine this is a home. This is where people spent time. This is where the governess would have worked with Anne and began to teach Anne. We know that Thomas Boleyn seemed to be of the same mind as someone like Thomas More, who believed that young women as well as young men deserve to be well-educated. So all three Boleyn children, George, of course, is the male heir, but also Mary and Anne received a very good education, not just in music and dance and embroidery, but also in language and in literature. And Anne in particular had a great facility for language. She was very good at languages. Something we see in her father, Thomas Boleyn, had an extraordinary facility for languages. And in her daughter, Elizabeth, Elizabeth could greet um, ambassadors when they came to the English court and speak to them in Italian or speak to them in Spanish or speak to them in French. She could speak several different languages. And that talent may very well have traced through the Boleyn family to Elizabeth. So we see this sense of their learning at Hever. Think of them growing up and having um, tutors and a governess and people who were teaching them at Hever to prepare them for life out in the world. Now, you can walk up these stairs and just imagine as you do, you're walking up the stairs, just like Anne did, of course, you know, that metal uh, bar wouldn't have been there. Perhaps the rope was. They're pretty twirly stairs. I certainly needed to grab onto something. But anyway, you can walk up those stairs and into the room that people think probably was Anne Boleyn's bedroom. Now, it's likely or at least very possible that she would have shared that room with her sister, Mary. So let's think about that. Um, sometimes we imagine Anne Boleyn and her sister, Mary Boleyn, as being at odds with each other, as always having a very difficult or fraught relationship. 
Now we know that they made different decisions regarding Henry VIII. And we also know that during Anne's time as queen, Mary made a marriage that was quite beneath her in terms of status, married a younger man, which was at that time quite controversial. And in any case, Anne considered it an embarrassment that the sister of the queen would have embarked on this sort of secretive marriage to someone who was not of the nobility. She was not sort of marrying up. And Anne by that time was quite desperate for a child. And Mary just seemed to be casually getting married and then got pregnant. And so it was very difficult for Anne and they did have a falling out. But that doesn't mean that throughout their childhood, they never got along. You know, we know Anne was very close to her brother, George, but it is likely that while they were growing up, Anne and Mary would have studied together, would have been taught together, would have spent a lot of time together, may have very well, may have shared a room. And so they probably had a much better relationship when they were younger. And these two images, which are now hanging so close to each other at Hever, you can really see a similar sense in these two young women and the way they're dressed and the way they look. Um, there's a lot of similarities that you can see in these two portraits. And I do like the idea of them hanging side by side. I think that's a brilliant idea. And thinking of these two sisters growing up together, their paths do diverge, but they did grow up together. And here is throughout this exhibition, there are these fantastic, beautiful, wonderful, creative, imaginative paintings by Dr. Owen Emerson, who has helped us imagine the Boleyns actually being in these spaces, using these spaces, learning, practicing music, spending time together as a family in these spaces. And so I'll share a couple of those. If you're lucky enough to see the exhibition or if you're lucky enough to have seen it, you will have seen these. Um, they're just exquisite, these paintings that Dr. Owen Emerson did. So big shout out to him. Really gives us a sense of how that space was a home. Yes, it's a castle. Yes, it's fortified. And yes, you have a sense of royalty because the king visited and, and all of that. But it's also, there are times it is just a family home and the Boleyn children are growing up there. They spend a lot of time there together. And it's probably at this point, you know, we see George sort of looking, I think it's supposed to be George at the fireplace um, and his sisters and his mother, you know, it's a family spending time together. And that's a nice way to think about it. Now, there comes a time when others visit Hever as well. So we know that Anne leaves Hever and she goes to the court first of Margaret of Austria. Now, how in the world does Anne Boleyn get a placement in this court? It was such a sought after position. Margaret of Austria was an extraordinary woman who was known for running this magnificent court. And it was, it was the thing, the place to be. Well, Thomas Boleyn had been appointed as an ambassador to her court, and he and Margaret of Austria got along very well. Perhaps it was his facility with language, perhaps it's his charm as a courtier, but in any case, it seems pretty clear that rather than Margaret of Austria communicating with her ambassador, who would then talk to Thomas Boleyn, she actually spoke with Thomas Boleyn directly, and the two of them seem to have, have made a bet, for example, when there was another ambassador coming from France and they sort of bet how soon he would get there. And if Margaret won, then Thomas would have to give her a horse. And if Thomas won, then Margaret would give him something. And so it's just really funny. Thomas ended up winning the bet. Um, but it's funny that they had this quite warm and open relationship, Thomas Boleyn and Margaret of Austria. And it seems that Thomas had perhaps sent something in his younger daughter and is the younger of the two girls. We're not sure a hundred percent exactly when they were born the year Anne Boleyn, It's sort of agreed by some historians it's 1501, but there's no exact record. But in any case, Mary was almost certainly born first, 
But Thomas chose his younger daughter, Anne, to be the one to get a place at Margaret of Austria's court after he had sort of um, charmed Margaret of Austria a little bit and set it up so that Margaret of Austria, and I'm just going to come out, it seems to me, I could just talk to you for a minute. So um, Anne goes to the court of Margaret of Austria now. She is a single woman. She's been widowed. (laughs) Margaret of Austria has and decides after her third marriage sort of ends her first marriage. It it was called off at the betrothal stage. And then she'd had two husbands die. And then she said, "Okay, I'm just going to stay a widow. So she's running this court on her own as a woman. And so she has a very strict household, but she uses the art of courtly love and she teaches the young women in her court to use courtly love, which relies in her court largely on language and wordplay. So in courtly love, the gentlemen of court choose a mistress, but it's in name only. It's a purely platonic relationship, but they serve the mistress. They write poetry for the mistress. They do service and activities for the mistress. And this is one of the ways that women who are running a court of men are able, and we see Elizabeth I do this as well, able to work with men and get men to do what this woman is telling them to do, which just straight out is something that they would have thought was appalling. How can a woman tell me what to do? Well, in the construct of courtly love, it becomes a lot easier. And so Margaret of Austria uses that and teaches her ladies to use that. And Anne Boleyn really picks up on that. She has a very ready wit. She becomes very confident. And those attributes allow her to be very good at that art of courtly love. So she goes on, she spends some time in the court of Margaret of Austria, and then Thomas has another opportunity. So he recalls her for that and has her join the court of Mary Tudor, as in Mary Tudor, the sister, there are so many Marys, Mary Tudor, the sister of Henry VIII, who's about to marry Charles XII of France. And so Anne comes to France. Her sister Mary is also in the train of Mary Tudor. And so these two sisters, Anne and Mary Boleyn, are again together in the court of Mary Tudor, who becomes the queen of France. Now, you may know this story. Charles is quite old. I'm sorry, Louis. Louis is quite old. I'm afraid I called him Charles earlier. It's Louis of France. He is quite old and the marriage only lasts a few months before he dies. Now here's Mary now as Dowager Queen of France. And she has decided, and and according to some sources, Henry VIII has agreed, although, you know, it seems like sometimes Henry VIII agrees with people in the moment to get them to do what he wants and then maybe wanted to take it back. I don't know. But in any case, without Henry's permission, Mary decides to marry Charles Brandon, Henry's best friend. So the two of them get married and then they have to kind of skulk back to England and beg forgiveness. Mary Boleyn also returns to England, but Anne stays in France and she serves the new French queen, Claude. And so she is once again in this glittering, sophisticated, the court of Francois le Premier, Francis I of France. And he is considered a real Renaissance king. He is a huge patron of the arts. He encourages Italian artists and all kinds of people to come to the French court and fill the palaces with art and music and literature. And Anne Boleyn is right at the heart of that court. And because of her facility with languages, it It's very possible that not only is she at court, but she's working perhaps as an interpreter. So she has quite a a position there and is very valued by Queen Claude and known by Francis as well. Now, when relationships with France begin to deteriorate a little bit, Anne is called home and in 1522, she returns to England. She doesn't come right back to Heber. We'll get her back there in a minute, but she goes to the English court. So 1522, she's in the English court. The first recorded activity of Anne at the English court is in the Chateau Vert pageant where she participates. It's held at Woolsey's home and he has constructed, he has had his servants construct this elaborate set for a mask or what we would call a play 
where, and it's this big wooden structure, it costs quite a bit of money, where there are fair maidens representing virtues who are in this castle and they are attacked and then they are rescued. And we know that Anne Boleyn participates, her sister Mary Boleyn participates, Mary Tudor, now the Duchess of Suffolk, the wife of Charles Brandon. These women are participating, people who play a large role in Anne's future. We also know that Henry VIII is there and Catherine of Aragon, his queen, are both there. There are imperial ambassadors there. Thomas Wolsey is there. All these people who play such large roles in Anne Boleyn's future are in this room, in this activity at 1522. It's really quite extraordinary to imagine them all, you know, sort of right there. So Anne Boleyn participates in this now. In some popular television shows, Henry VIII casts his eye on Anne Boleyn at that pageant, and that is actually not true. During this time, Henry VIII is involved, actually, with Mary Boleyn, and Anne becomes, as she spends some time in the English court, her marriage, possible marriage to James Butler falls through, but she becomes involved with Henry Percy, who was the heir to the Earl of Northumberland. Well, Woolsey finds out about that. He doesn't think Anne Boleyn, the the daughter of a knight, is nearly good enough, and neither does Henry Percy's father. And so their relationship is broken up, and Anne Boleyn is sent back to Hever. So let's go ahead and take her back to Hever. So she's sent back to Hever. She does come and go from court, and it's during this time after the relationship With Percy breaks up, she has some kind of relationship with Thomas Wyatt. He grew up in Allington. She grew up in Hebrew. They're both in Kent, so they're sort of neighbors. So maybe they knew each other before they went to court. Thomas Wyatt is a poet and a courtier, sort of like Henry VIII thought of himself as a king and a poet. But in any case, um, Thomas Wyatt did write poetry that many people think is associated with Anne Boleyn, particularly his poem, Who So List to Hunt, which talks about how she has engraven around her neck, No les mitangere, for Caesar's I am, touch me not, for Caesar's I am. And Wyatt is also sent away on a foreign diplomatic mission. At the same time, we believe the king is showing some interest in Anne. So possibly the king's a bit jealous. But in any case, the king does become interested in Anne in about 1526. And Anne does come and go from Hever during this time. And I like to imagine, this is one of the beautiful, I just love these windows and looking outside. So imagine Anne sort of looking outside and wondering who it is coming to visit her. Is Henry coming to visit? Because he made many um, journeys to Hever Castle and Anne might have looked out the window and seen him coming and decided whether to see him or not. He had, Henry, the king had sort of expected her when he showed some interest to immediately become his mistress. And in whatever language she actually used, what has passed down is Anne saying to the king, your wife, I cannot be both in view of my own unworthiness and because you have a wife already, your mistress, I will not be. Now, that may not have been been exactly what she said, but that's sort of the phrasing that's passed down. And in any case, Henry begins this pursuit of Anne. It starts with courtly love, and these letters begin to come to Anne while she's at Heber, and the king comes as well. And by tradition, this is the room that the king would have stayed in. This is called the king's bedroom at Heber. You'll notice there's a portrait there of someone that was previously identified as Catherine Howard. So that wasn't there at the time. But um, the idea is the best room in the castle would obviously be the one that was given to the king. And the king did come to Hever sometimes and then would bring Anne back to court with him. So there was a fairly lengthy relationship and courtship. We think it started around 1526 and Anne was coming and going from Hever. But she had to decide what to do because it was clear that Henry began to be by 1526. It had been 10 years since Princess Mary had been born and Catherine of Aragon had long since stopped having pregnancies and Henry was getting really desperate for a son. And so he was ready to make a change. And that's when Anne Boleyn is appearing 
in the story. And so she is going to need to decide, does she really want to go all in? And I can imagine her, this is the courtyard, you know, perhaps looking up at her bedroom or pacing the courtyard, getting outside for a little while back at Heber, wondering what to do. Is she ready to make that kind of commitment to the king to up and everyone's life like that? Is she ready? She had served in Catherine of Aragon's court. Was she ready to do that? And we can imagine Anne retreating to Heber. This is where she makes the decision, probably with her father. And again, this is one of Dr. Owen Emerson's paintings, but imagining Anne receiving counsel from her father as this relationship with the king is going on. So many of those famous letters that are now in the Vatican that Henry VIII wrote to Anne Boleyn were received by her and read by her here at Hever. So that's kind of remarkable to think about. We also know that while Anne is at, um, while Anne is at court, she becomes sick and is believed to have the sweating sickness. And Henry, of course, loves her very much. But if you've got the sweating sickness, get away from me. So Anne goes to Hever again when she is ill. That's where she goes. That's where she goes to talk to her father. That's where she goes when she's ill. Even though they have other homes, Hever is always the one she goes to. And it's possible, this is her beautiful book at our, of hours that's at Hever. It's possible that it's while she has the sweating sickness that she writes um, in her book of hours, remember me when you doth pray, when you do pray that hope doth last from day to day. She probably felt like she was facing death when she had the sweating sickness. Many people died. It just came on and you could be fine. It's described you could be fine in the morning and dead by nightfall. I mean, it was just a terrible disease and does recover, but there would have been some time. Maybe she wasn't sure she would. And she was there at Hever. We know she had these two books of ours at Hever. Two of them are still at Hever. And I think there's another one in the British Library. So Anne is at Hever. She's made the decision to marry the king. She gets well over the sweating sickness, and she is, she's ready. She's ready for that fight. And it is a fight. So I imagine Anne sort of riding away from Hever for the last time on her way to court. She is going to go all in her family's with her, but she is leaving a home that has been quite beloved to her. And one of the things I think this is, is just such a remarkable castle, but one of the things I like to think about is Anne as an actual person, as a woman who is making these decisions, who doesn't know what the future holds. The king's promising all kinds of stuff, but you know what? He promised Catherine of Aragon all kinds of stuff too. And Anne is watching him change his mind. And so she knows he changes his mind. And so she is taking a big chance and she must have known that. And so it's really interesting to think of her shifting. And that's what I was thinking about her shifting from a life at Hebrew where she could go and retreat to a life at Hampton Court. And that's just an example, of course, that was not the only palace, but it is a palace where we can still see a lot of Anne Boleyn. And that's why I've decided um, to take us from Hever to Hampton Court, because we can see so much at Hampton Court. Seems like whenever I go to Hampton Court, it's kind of a rainy gray day. I still love Hampton Court, rain or shine. So if you ever have the chance, it's quite easy to get there from London. The train stops right there by this, you know, you can easily walk from the station to the palace. So highly, highly, highly recommend Hampton Court as I do Hever. And you can see, again, I don't like pictures of myself, but there I am at Hampton Court. It's, um, October. And I guess um, the idea of Halloween pumpkins is now alive and well at Hampton Court. My husband asked me if those pumpkins had been there since the days of Henry VIII. Ha ha. And then I replied that perhaps during Henry VIII's time, he used heads to decorate at Halloween instead of pumpkins. Ha ha. So a little macabre humor gone back and forth at my house. But in any case, here we are at Hampton Court, one of Henry VIII's favorite palaces and one that he inherited from Wolsey. And so as Anne came into possession of Hampton Court, she might have thought back to the time that Thomas Wolsey didn't think she was good enough to marry Henry Percy. And here she is marrying Henry Tudor. So Anne is at 
Hampton Court. Here is a sunny day when I was there. That's not from this most recent trip, but it's from an earlier trip of mine. And I was there on a sunny day. And much of this, yes, a lot of it has been restored. And um, the Victorians did a few um, very interesting, made some interesting decisions. But much of it does look like, and some of it actually is, from Tudor time. So you can imagine coming to Hampton Court. Of course, most people would have come by river rather by the, than by the road, which we have here. But coming to Hampton Court and being prepared to enter this great palace. Now, if you go through the Anne Boleyn Gateway, and yes, I've been told that this has been recreated, but I like to think that there was a time it really looked like this. And certainly we know there was all kinds of decorative activity going on at Hampton Court. We have records of that. Henry renovated the whole place. And he was dedicated as his commitment to Anne kept growing and growing and they got closer to finally getting married um, to that. You can see on the left, the H and A entwined. And so there are carvings of H and A entwined in this ceiling. That's probably been re almost certainly been redone, but maybe it was there originally too. And you also on the right see Anne Boleyn's badge, which is the Falcon. Um, and so those two elements, I want you to, you know, keep in mind the H and A and the Falcon, because they are very important to Anne Boleyn. And they are part of, you see in the center, just a larger view of the ceiling. There's also, of course, um, the portcullis for Margaret Beaufort. There's several Tudor roses. There's a fleur de lis because Henry thinks he's king of France. So there are all kinds of elements that mean a great deal to Henry. Now, what I'm just going to leave Hampton Court for just a moment to take you to King's College Chapel, the University of Cambridge. If you ever have a chance to go to Cambridge and go to King's College Chapel, go up to the screen and you will see that the H and A right there in the center, you can see that really well. And then just a little bit up to the right, you can see the falcon. You can't see the whole thing, but you can see the branch growing out of the stump and you can see the falcon's leg holding the scepter. So they are able to date when this was created, when it was built, when it was carved, because it turns out Henry's marriage to Anne Boleyn, when the falcon was actually crowned and holding that scepter, wasn't all that long. And in fact, in other parts of the screen, instead of the H and A entwined, Henry goes back to just HR for Henry Rex. So you can sort of see, oh, that must be after 1536 when Anne Boleyn has fallen. So it's really interesting. But that H, A and the Falcon, those were very important. And they were all kinds of places. Henry really believed as his father had, you know, that Tudor Rose that Henry VII came up with everywhere. Well, the Falcon and the h &A were in many places as well. All right. So I want you to just kind of imagine, yes, this is a very recent recreation of a Tudor garden, but imagine Anne Boleyn walking around Hampton Court Palace and spending time in the gardens and among these Tudor buildings and meeting with courtiers and meeting with her friends and her ladies and members of her family and talking to the king. This was a very important place in their life. And we know Anne was quite involved in the extensive renovations that Henry did at Hampton Court. And one of the real showcases of Hampton Court is the Great Hall. And you see that marvelous ceiling and look at a zoom in on that ceiling. The hammer bean ceiling is really quite extraordinary. And you can see the pendants hanging down. It's just wonderful. But if you look to the right and the left of the pendants where it meets the wall, you can see some coats of arms and some of those are Anne Boleyn's. So the ceiling, you can see how high it is. It's just, it's, it's about 60 feet high, I believe. And so even after Anne had fallen from favor, people weren't climbing back up there. We know that Henry and Anne were paying for candles. Well, 
Hampton was being renovated and that was so workers could work through the night. None of this just stopping when daylight hours go away. Just because the sun went down doesn't mean you should stop. So workers worked through the night to get all this done. And I guess they just weren't that eager to climb back up and scrape off the H&A. And so you can see many of those. So in the Great Hall, which is hung with the Abraham tapestries and just an amazing place to visit. I will say that it's often full of people. This was a very lucky time that I I had a moment where the hall was almost empty, except for just that um, Hampton Court employee. You can see there on the left in the red coat. But other than that, I had it to myself, which is really an extraordinary feeling. You can just soak up the history. But in addition to some coats of arms, up on the um, ceiling, there's something very important, which is, and I will tell you, this is very high. And yes, I good, I have a good iPhone, but you know, the camera is not, it's not the newest iPhone, but in any case, I believe that central figure there is the Falcon. Again, we know that Anne's Falcon would have decorated Hampton Court Palace during her reign, during her heyday, during her time of glory. And the Falcon was crowned. And I believe that that is one of them. It's very high. It's very hard to see. But I think that's one of them. And of course, as you know, recently there was a Falcon discovered. And so this is now on display at Hampton Court Palace. I actually got to see it with my own eyes. Cannot tell you how exciting that was for me to see that beautiful, beautiful falcon. It has been restored. It is covered in this beautiful gold. And you can see the red and white of the flowers is just is just so beautiful. And probably that's what was around the palace. That's what was decorating these brightly colored, beautiful elements to celebrate Anne Boleyn. So while she was at Hampton Court, it was this beautiful place that was in part a celebration of her. So as we think about walking where Anne walked, um, I really feel like both Heber Castle, where she gets her start, and Hampton Court, where she experiences sort of the height of her glory. And now where we're able to see that falcon. I don't know how long it will be on display, but it is just magnificent. And it is so exciting to see it there. And to imagine this woman that we think we know so well, think of her as just a real person walking through these halls and looking up. And just probably sometimes being shocked to look up and see that golden crown falcon, a badge that she had chosen, an emblem of this bird that's a hunter and that's so determined to get to its prey. And for that short in comparison period of time, she really had achieved it all. And then as the sun begins to set, on Hampton Court, we know that after, you know, less than three years after her grand and glorious coronation, that Anne Boleyn at some point sailed away from Hampton Court for the last time. Uh, And in May of 1536, everything fell apart. If you want to think about it on May 1st, She's sitting next to the king, recognized as queen at the May Day Joust. And on May 19th, she is beheaded at the order of her husband. And it's an unbelievable, violent, speedy fall. But before that, and I think sometimes we rush to that, think of the moments that she did spend walking at Hever, walking at Hampton and experiencing all of these amazing things. And I also like to imagine that 500 years later, 500 years after she sort of burst upon the English court, because of recent recent history, the recent discovery of that falcon, and the recent history that Kate McCaffrey has done on the Book of Hours of Anne Boleyn, where she's found the inscriptions of future owners who knew Anne 
and kept the book safe so that later it could be shared with Anne's daughter, Elizabeth, who of course goes on to reign to become the longest reigning tutor and many believe the greatest tutor and one of the greatest monarchs in English history, Elizabeth I. So thank you so much for joining me for Walking With Me, where Anne Boleyn walked, where we see her start from childhood at Hever to going back to Hever. That was her special retreat to some glory days at Hampton Court. And now I think it's just extraordinary that both Hever and Hampton Court house these very exciting, recently researched items that continue to tell Anne's story in such powerful ways. So thank you so much for listening and watching. If you watched, I would love to hear what you think, especially of doing some videos. Tell me if you liked them, if it works for you. And thank you so much for being with me as we walk where Anne walked and shake up history together.